Um, all right. Hello, everyone. I'm Ryan. Nice to see you this afternoon. I'm happy to be here at my first NixCon in Europe uh, before I've only come virtually. So I'm happy to see you all here, all these smiling faces. Thank you all. All right. So uh, if you heard Teofane's lightning talk, he basically stole my whole talk. Um, he has a slide on there that he exactly ripped off of my slides. So we'll, well, we'll talk about it later, Teofane. But anyway, I'm going to talk about how uh, at Replit we're using eval modules to declare the uh, configuration for our IDE. And let's get going with that. So uh, my name is Ryan TM, uh, Ryan, and I uh, learned about NixOS in 2015. And I made the uh, updater bot that many of you are familiar with that updates Nix packages. And uh, I also made Agenix, which uh, does security or secure secrets for NixOS. Uh, last year, I started working at Replit, uh, which is a big contributor to uh, various Nix things uh, in terms of we well, contributed to the documentation team recently uh, and other uh, contributions to the foundation. Uh, Replit has used Nix for about two years, two or three years to configure system packages of our containers that all of our customers use. Uh, here's what Replit looks like. Uh, so it's an online ID that you can use to uh, program whatever you want. You get a Linux container uh, that has basically full computing access that you would get inside of a container. And you get an IDE, and they're connected together. And most recently, you get a way to actually deploy your code, too, uh, with a few clicks. And uh, this IDE can be configured. And the way that we used to configure it is this TOML file. And you're not supposed to read all that. It's just I'm trying to cram a bunch onto one slide. Um, but there's lots of things you might want to configure, like the packager or your language server or formatter you use or environment variables. And this is how people could configure their, rep their REPLs, uh, their containers, and the IDE before. But this had some problems with it. Can you shout out one that you might think of a problem with this system for configuring things? Composability, good. Syntax errors, great. That's a, that was a big one for us, actually, with our customers not particularly being super familiar with TOML files. All right, so yes, there's lots of problems. So uh, major ones was that these configurations were copied whenever you fork a REPL. So when you ever someone copies a container to use, or there's a mechanism on REPL where you can fork a container, exact copy of it. When you got that, it's a copy of the TOML file um, from that other REPL. Is, is Should I switch? Hello? Thank you. Oh, that, thanks. Um, yeah, so there's also, also it's too complex to edit and brittle. And it was also hard for our team to add new dependencies to the uh, REPL environment. So like, for example, if we wanted to fix something about the Python debugger that we were using, for example, we had to uh, go through a long process. Um, the, the, the way that we deliver Nix packages to the containers is we take the entire cache.nixos.org and put it onto a giant uh, a disk that we connect to all the REPLs. So if you make a REPL on REPLit, you have access to like everything that is cached in a particular channels. Um, but that process is makes of making a very big disk makes it hard for us to ship a small change alongside it, right? So we we're setting out to fix that problem as well. And there's no way to upgrade users. So the users just get whatever's in their TOML file, and then it's hard to later make edits to that file if they want like an upgrade to a new version of Python or a new version of Node or something like that. All right, so what did we do uh, to fix this problem? We chose to use Nix, and we chose to use eval modules. And I'm going to try to go through why we chose that and try to encourage you to think about how you might be able to use eval modules for your particular use case, uh, your own configuration at work, or maybe some new project that you're starting. 
And uh, after we did that, this is kind of the end product that we came to. Um, so inside of the TOML file, the users just have to write this one line, or it's in most cases we write it for them, and then they're good to go. And this, in the back end, is uh, made possible with Nix and eval modules. And the, re the code that uh, generates this stuff is open source, uh, these modules, and it's available at that URL there, uh, or that QR code. And um, we have a bunch of different languages right now, and we're, we want to add more. And we've been focusing on making sure that Python and Node are great right now, uh, but then we're going to go and work on other languages in the future. We have a few already. Um, so why choose Nix for configuration? Let's explore that a little bit. All right, so here's an example. Uh, we're inside a Nix REPL here, and we're going to import Nix packages. And we're going to call uh, eval modules, which is a library function available inside of Nix packages. And what does eval modules take? It takes an adder set. And one of the main things you might want to pass to that adder set is um, the modules list. And these are the lists of modules. and um, if you've used NixOS, then you're familiar with maybe what a module is, because your configuration is a module. Uh, in, the, in the context of NixOS, your configuration of the module is more, or a module has a lot of options that are provided for you for NixOS, but there is a core module system that you can use that doesn't include those options. So it's like a more stripped down core abstraction of the modules system that you are familiar with from NixOS. Um, uh, for example, it has options and configuration. I guess if you're doing, if you're configuring your NixOS environment, you might not have seen options too much, but that's the underlying thing that all of the configurations do. So if you want to, say, configure your host name, then there's also a corresponding option available that was put into the module system for NixOS, for example. All right, so after we've called eval modules on this, we get an adder set, and if we take out the config at attribute of that, which is kind of like the output of eval modules for most purposes, and we call to JSON on that, we get this output here. And we just, and we, so for example, we had a message option that's a string, and then we set that to hello world, and we get out this configuration. Um, but wait. Wasn't that a lot of code just for writing like a little JSON fragment? This is something that someone asked me when I gave this talk earlier. They're like, why should you use this big configuration language when it's just like you're just writing some JSON? Why don't you just write the JSON, right? Yeah. Um, anyone want to shout out why they think that they might want to do this instead of just writing some configuration as a flat file? Because you're a programmer. Right, yeah, you want to do some like parameterization or something like that. You want to like loop over all your machines and write the configure every machine maybe or something like that, right? Any other reasons? Context? context? String context. String context. Oh man, you stole my next slide. All right, all right, let's go on. <laughs> so um, yeah, so now we're gonna try this a little bit more complicated of an example. All right, so basically everything's the same except now we're, we're defining a runner and well, uh, in Replit, a runner is this, where in Replit we have this big green button at the top of the screen, and that's like, run my code. And it, it's like it's a simple interface for doing things. So we have, uh, so you might want to have a runner for Python, for example. So here's a kind of stripped down example of that. Um, so we have the runner option, and then we've uh, interpolated in this Python 3 to access the Python binary. And by doing that, we've, uh, introduce this dependency here by interpolating this into the string, as he said, and then that comes out in our configuration, which is interesting. So now we have this configuration that has the Nix store path inside of it. So at least now in our configuration file, we have this pointer to somewhere else that says, hey, we need that software to be available inside of our configuration. That sounds useful. Okay, let's um, go one step further maybe. Let's take this configuration and let's like write it to a file so that we can like put it somewhere or use it in some place. So I'm, I've wrapped this example here in write text. So we're gonna take this uh, to JSON, the JSON that we created, and we're gonna stick it into a text file in the next store. And when we do that, we've created, and we, when we uh, run this in the REPL, we have a derivation. 
Um, okay, why should we have a derivation? Maybe this is like speaking to the choir to ask you guys that question, but let's, uh, let's look into that. So this is the same slide, except for now we're in the REPL, we're gonna build this. Uh, you may, uh, yeah, if you're in a REPL and you have a derivation available to you, you can do colon B in front of it and that will build it for you and it'll tell you the output. So here at the bottom here, we can see we've got a store path here that has the configuration. And why is that interesting? Well, we can run this command, nix path info, and get the closure size of this derivation of this store path that we've created. And we can see that it has a bunch of uh, dependencies that are associated with this. You know, all the dependencies of Python that are available are now listed here. So we have this list of information about what our configuration depends on and all of the details of what it depends on, which is really, really useful. And I like to call this configuration plus closure. I think this is what uh, makes Nix great. It's not that we just have some configuration files and it's not that we just have some like um, list of packages that you might use and you want to extract onto your hard drive. It's that we have both of those. So by having both of those together in the same place, wrapped up as like a nice neat package, we can use that to leverage great things that we've done as a community. And so configuration plus closure, I think is a great way to talk about what makes Nix great for you. All right, uh, can you shout out some projects that you know that use eval modules already? What's an example of a project that uses eval modules? Haskell.nix, Haskell cool. Haskell.nix, cool. Dream to Nix, yeah, good, good example. They recent, Nix OS, good. Home manager. Disco? Oh yeah, that's the disk, uh, the new disk thing you guys made, cool. The disk, DevEnv, yeah, good example, cool. Yeah, yeah, Replit, yeah, we're using it too, that's what the point of this talk, yeah. Someone said DNS, dot, cool, all right. Yeah, so there's a lot of cool projects that are using this. And why do you think that is? It's because it's really, it's been re really useful, as Teofane was pointing out in his talk uh, earlier. Um, but you can use it too. Let's try to learn more about that and try to like learn about the details of it some now so we can all go home and write our own new projects that are using module systems. Uh, right, so it, what is eval modules? It basically is taking a list of modules and it's a function, you call it, and you get out some configuration plus closure. Um, so now I'll go to here and I'm gonna be in a terrible situation because I'm supposed to type while doing this. I don't know, can I put on this thing? Upside down? Upside down. Your Honor, just hold the mic for you. Uh, um, thank you, yeah, so, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and go to this URL, and it's, uh, uh, this is uh, my exam. All right, good luck. I'm dual wielding now. Okay, thank you, yeah, I can. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so um, yeah, so you can go to this URL to um, hang out and play with this, or you can just use uh, Flakes directly to mess with it. So um, yeah, like if you wanna just use Flakes, can you, should I make that bigger? Are we good in the back? Okay, so if we, yeah, you can just like do ryantm slash eval modules, right, for this. Oops, I don't wanna actually. Okay, right, so I've written this uh, little example here that shows you like how you might take uh, some eval modules examples, have the output for it, so like what configuration output it is, and also what the closure is for it, so you can see that. Um, and we'll just go through some of these examples here. So this is a very simple example, it's just we're passing in the empty module. So it's basically just we're not going to get any output. And, we get, and also the closure is very small in that case, just the file. Um, and then we'll do example one. So in this one, I showed this earlier, but basically we're just doing the hello world. We have some option adder set that defines a message option and it has to be of type string. And then we pass that in and we get out uh, the hello world. And it also still has a very small closure because it doesn't depend on anything. Uh, and then we'll do 
another example here. All right, so now this is getting a little bit more complicated now, and we're going to see some interesting new features of the module system here. So in this case, we have two modules that we're passing in. And the first module makes use of this special parameter that the module system uses. If you say underscore module dot args, you can add new arguments that are sent to all of the other modules uh, as, as, um, as the function parameters. And for in this case, we're setting it equal to the Nix packages output. And then we have another module here on line, starting on line nine that has a function, uh, or it's a function, so it has the inputs passed to it, and it takes in the packages. And then for here, we're going to start building up kind of like, sort of like what Replit is. So we're, uh, LSP is a language server, so uh, we're going to define how you might configure a language server for your IDE. So uh, we are saying it has a name, just so we can maybe in the interface say what the name of the language server is somewhere. And then we also have a start command, how you're going to start the language server. Um, and those are both strings. And so then we configure them here, and we say go LSP, and then we're interpolating in Go. So now Go, the Go, pro, uh, the Go language server will become a dependency of this. And you can see that now our output's here. We have LSP and the two parameters. And the closure is equal, or it has the Go LSP as part of it. Um, but what if you want to have like multiple, what if you want to have multiple LSPs in the same configuration? So now we're going to use another feature of the type system of modules, which is called submodules. And those are sometimes a scary feature, but we'll kind of, ju we'll just do a very simple one here, and you can, maybe that'll help you understand the concept. Um, so the only difference here now is we have this new let block here in our second module. And we defined a submodule called language server. And it has those same options that we already defined earlier. And then down in our actual options for our module system, we have uh, this LSP option, which has type adders of submodule, the module we defined above. And by default, we're saying it's empty. Then uh, we've def then still we define the same one as before, except now instead of just LSP, or we have LSP.go instead of just LSP like we had before. So this .go is going to be like the v the value, or sorry, the the key of the adder set, and then the value is what we have below. And then uh, this hasn't changed much. We just have an another level of indentation here in our uh, another level of nesting in our adder set, and the closure is exactly the same as before. Now, we can go look at this one, which is just the exact same thing as before, but now we're going to add the actual other LSP. So the only thing we had to change here is these lines 25, uh, these last few lines here. We add Rust, and then we can interpolate in the Rust analyzer to get that LSP available to us as well. And then we can, I guess I'm I think I was like paging there. Okay, oops. But the, then here we have the LSP, the two LSPs, Go and Rust, both appear at the same nesting in there. And then in the closure, we have the Rust analyzer and Go available in our closure. Great. Um, so let's, let's do one more example here to learn about uh, another aspect of the module system. Uh, there's this concept of uh, like overriding things, and this is really important if you want to compose different modules together. Like you might want to override some information uh, about a module, uh, and this is kind of what Teofane was talking about earlier. We can like do overrides within the module system. We don't need to have some special overriding functions for all the different cases. We can do it this way. Um, so in this case, I have a few different options that I've made here. So the first option I made is called default. That's just the name I chose. But we've set the default of that option to the string default. And we made another option called configured. And we set that also to the string default. We made another one called forced and set that equal to the string default. And then we have inside the config, we've set configured to configured and forced to configured. And then we have a separate module. We have a separate module that is what 
uh, where we have this lib.mk force, which, which will force the overriding of this. Uh, and by having these different levels of overriding, so like the default, the configuration, and the force, then we get these three different ones here, and that does that. Uh, right. So let's move on to the next part. So now we, we have this configuration and closure. How are we going to deliver that? How are we going to actually like, make this useful to, making it, uh, to sending it out to someone? Um, so you can deliver eval modules in also all the ways you might think of. Typical Nix ways, use flakes, copy closure, Nix bundle. You can also make a Docker container or disk image. You can do all of these things. You can do all of them if you need to. And you note you can potentially even do this on a machine that does not have Nix installed. Um, it's OK to use Nix stores without Nix being installed on machines. Scary thought, huh? OK. Um, let's, let's look at this example real quick. So I have an example here. If we say, well, let's look this up real quick. So if we look at my flake.nix file, we have uh, example four before where we had the Rust analyzer in the Go. Um, we're building a layered image based on that. And we're uh, a layered Docker image based on that. And we have this command here where we're running bash. And then we're using jq to suck out our configuration JSON file to figure out what the Rust LSP should be. And then we're calling dot version on that, or dash dash version on that. And then we have this other one that's going to quickly load this into Docker and run it. So let's try uh, running that real quick. So we'll say uh, Docker for. Uh, Oh, shoot, what was it again? Docker, yeah, there we go, okay. Docker for load and run. And we can see that it we ran our Docker container, and it told us the version of the Rust analyzer. So we've uh, showed that we're using Docker. Um, at Replit, we are kind of we kind of have a lot of ways that we're delivering this to the end user. So we have these bundles of modules. And we deliver them in lots of sorts of ways. So we have a disk image that we attach to all the REPLs that we've built of all the modules. We also um, build Docker layers that are in a special uh, Sochi seekable format so we can stream these layers to make our deployments product faster. We also build them into a squash FS that lets us do local dev with a smaller subset of the modules so we can test out things. And we just and with Nix, you can have all these different ways that you're delivering things, uh, which is really neat and useful. All right, so uh, at the hackathon later, maybe people are interested. If they're interested, talk to me about maybe we can write a backend for looking at this JSON file uh, in Vim or Emacs or VS Code. Maybe we can try to see how we can configure all these different IDEs in the same way. So we can take a look at that together. If you're interested, let me know. And I also wanted to acknowledge my coworker, Toby Ho, who was, uh, did a lot of the work on the Nix modules project. And I wanted to give him a special shout out for that. Um, and now I wanted to say also that Replit is hiring. Uh, so if you are interested in learning more about Nix and doing these kind of big projects with Linux and big, working on big things like that, come talk to me. Uh, I can, we can see if we can get something going. And uh, yeah, any questions now? For our precisely two questions. And remember, if you ask a question, you get one of these awesome 3D printed pogs, unless you work for Flux. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I think there's been a lot of talk about config, like Linus was talking about using config and flakes, um, or Theophan talked about it a lot, and now you're talking about eval modules. Um, do you think that eval modules is, like, there's some issues with it, like um, performance, um, how long it takes to eval something, or like debugging can be pretty tough. Do you think that eval modules is like the way to go, um, or do you think um, we kind of need something that's a bit better to solve config for all of these different use cases. Um, I would say, like, yeah, I mean, I, I won't not take something better, right? <laughs> like, if, if you can make something better, like, uh, a lot of the things about Nickel looked good when he sh was showing that with the, that. But what we have now, this is, like, the best thing we have now. And it's, like, so much better than a lot of, like, stuff people are using in industry. Um, being able to have your dependencies together, being able to merge 
different people's modules together. Like that's something that people struggle really hard with. But with Nix, you can take someone's module and import it into your Nix OS configuration, and it just works. And that's like pretty magical and like not really repeated in other places. So I would say, yeah, use eval modules, but yeah, look out for other things that could be better, but around the same kind of way. Come on. Hello. There we go. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I imagine most of Replit's customers aren't Nix users or experts. Have you considered continuing to use Toml via import Toml with the eval module system? Um, oh, you're saying Toml has a way to like import other Toml files together? Um, if the user is only configuring and not defining new options, uh, that's just key value JSON, right? So there, hmm. the, the previous version of the Replit DSL uh, could be exposed via Toml too. Hmm. Yeah, um, we still have the Toml system in place. You can still use it. Um, it's available. Um, but yeah, right now the Nix module system is not very extensible by the users. We hope to fix that by making Nix work better inside of the containers. And then uh, there's going to be a lightning talk on that tomorrow about, uh, from Ben Radford about some work we sponsored to make a layered store that makes Nix better in Replit. Um, but until then, it's hard for us to integrate that aspect. Yeah. All right, everybody, let's give Ryan a hand.